Okay, so this is a quick intro, um, but a, a sort of different intro into electrochemistry than you've probably ever seen before. Um, uh, I'm an electrochemist. I love electrochemistry. It's my training. It's where my PhD is in. Um, electrochemistry, I think, is objectively the most important science um, in the modern age. And, uh, and I say that objectively. Uh, of course, that's a joke. But um, I really do think that it's one of the most important fields of study. Um, it's one of the more challenging to uh, enter into just because there's a lot going on. Uh, and it requires sort of a, a happy blend of chemistry and chemical intuition, a really good chemical intuition, um, but also a good intuition uh, in terms of physics. Uh, and so we'll talk a little bit about both today, um, but I'm going to give you um, a little bit of flavor for the utility of electrochemistry, why it's arguably the most important or one of the most important fields right now uh, as it pertains to the uncertainty in uh, our energy future as, as a species as, and uh, society, but also our uncertainty with climate change. And I'll link both of them to electrochemistry fundamentally. And so many, many, many of the fundamental research questions we have as humans, at least in terms of our own self-preservation, are linked to electrochemistry, either through energy or climate science. And so um, those are two, um, I guess, pitches to make it uh, relevant. So I'm going to show you the front end of, or a few slides of, of a talk that I give, a general audience talk, when I talk about one of my research projects that my lab works on um, for the last several years uh, that aims at developing new sensors that are electrochemical based uh, that are super cheap, super affordable, uh, and easy to use and don't require any training and they're smartphone based so anybody with a smartphone can use them but they'll allow you to quantify really quickly concentration of heavy metals in your drinking water at levels that matter to your health. Believe it or not, those tools don't really exist. Um, and that's a whole nother framing talk that I could give about water quality uh, in the United States, but also globally and how abysmal it is. Even though we think that we've got that problem solved, we are far, far from it. Uh, and so there's a, there's a huge demand for tools like this, and that's one of the projects my research group focuses on. So these are some priming slides that I use when I give that talk. And so electrochemistry, uh, as you know, as, as somebody who's been exposed to electrochemistry at least once in your um, Gen Chem 2 course, in Chem 108, um, you know that electrochemistry really is the combination of electricity and chemistry. Um, that's the portmanteau, electrochemistry, that's what it means, but it also fundamentally means that. It means how do we take energy in the form of electrostatic energy and impose that upon chemical species, and how do we reconcile those two different worlds, one in terms of voltage and current and charge and capacitance uh, and thinking about you know, taking a wire from a wall but then putting that into a beaker which we're much more familiar with as chemists, right? We think about things in terms of the change in free energy, enthalpy, entropy, um, we think about solutions, we think a little bit about redox chemistry, which is maybe the, the foray into electrochemistry that we've been, um, been privy to before this. So we need to bring those two worlds together. And so I've got uh, a really, uh, this is actually a practical um, sort of picture of what electrochemistry is. You've got two conductors and the energy of those two conductors is separated or different simply because they're connected to two poles of a battery. What is a battery? Those are actual electrochemical reactions inside of the battery. So it's sort of meta, electrochemistry doing electrochemistry. So the energy change, uh, the difference in voltage at two halves of the battery are simply the difference in voltage of the two half reactions that comprise that battery. That sets the electron energy at different levels at these two poles, one in this rectangular chunk of metal and one in the spoon if you're lucky, and there's some redox species in solution, and you apply a sufficiently high energy to reduce or add electrons, then that process will occur, as long as the other side of your reaction is sufficiently low to accept electrons. It has to be lower than whatever that redox potential is. Um, there's a couple different directions uh, in which chemistry and electricity are related, right? We can do chemical reactions or control them or design them in a way that they produce electricity and that's a huge branch of science um, and those are things 
that are often affiliated with energy. So we have uh, like solar is in intimately related to electrochemistry. Fuel cell is electrochemistry. It's it's a it's a it's a battery essentially that uses liquid or gaseous reagents. We of course have batteries like lithium ion batteries, which I love to talk about. So get me started there. Um, and then we have electric vehicles, which are sort of a product of um, you know batteries, but then transducing that energy into some sort of um, some sort of electric drive or electric motor. All of these things are electrochemical, but we're specifically taking uh, potential energy in the form of bonds uh, in terms of um, our redox species. We're allowing those to proceed from a high energy state to a low energy state, and then we're constructing our devices to, to, to yield that energy, to grab it, and then use it to do work. That's the first direction we'll talk about. But of course, we can go the opposite direction. Right? We can take electricity in energy, which is really just a change in voltage, we can apply that to a chemical system. There's lots of examples. This is massively industrially relevant. Um, of course, electroplating is one that we're really familiar with because if you're wearing jewelry right now or looking at metal objects around you, chances are, unless those are pure metal objects, which chances are low, uh, instead there's some cheap base metal that's been plated with a thin layer, electroplated with a very thin layer of some noble metal, which protects the metal on the inside but also saves cost from manufacturing. Uh, so lots of gold, platinum, and palladium rings are nickel at the base because nickel is cheap and then we can electrochemically drive a redox reaction from gold plus to gold zero at the surface of that electrode and then we get a nice thin layer of our gold. Same thing is done with silver, really any coinage metal. Uh, electroplating chrome, so anything that has chrome, whether that's a vehicle or your you know, receptacles in your sink in your kitchen or your bathroom, virtually anything that's shiny metal probably isn't that pure metal. Um, we would all be in bad shape if, if we had pure chrome everywhere around us because that stuff would be dissolving and poisoning us all the time. Uh, which is a different conversation. Uh, auto parts, so anything shiny, again, is probably uh, this process where we're taking electrical potential energy and putting that into to make bonds or to drive redox reactions. Another natural one that's really interesting is lightning. So lightning is a, is a natural electrochemical phenomenon where you have water vapor in the air, there's some dissolved oxygen in that air, uh, it doesn't even have to be dissolved, it can be gaseous oxygen, and that, um, that high voltage difference between the top of the cloud and the bottom of the ground, that's why lightning spans that difference is because there's thousands of volts of energy difference there. Um, if you, if um, that discharges over oxygen molecules, it can drive uh, the production of an oxygen atom, which uh, or an oxygen radical that reacts with O2 to produce ozone or O3, and that's that sweet smell that you smell after a lightning storm. Uh, that's ozone that's been electrochemically generated by lightning in the air. Another really common place where you see this this direction of electricity to chemical reactions is in the industrial production of a lot of commodity chemicals. So things like um, chlorine or sodium or sodium hydroxide, all of those are done in large scale electrochemical reactors. So in a Chem 108 class, we would have classified these two directions as two different types. And you may not have made that connection, but let's make that connection really clear now. If you're going from a chemical reaction, and you're harvesting the natural energy of the system, and the free energy of the system, and having that drive some work later, create electricity, we call that direction a galvanic process. And so this direction here, the spontaneous direction is one that's galvanic, and that's one where the change in free energy is negative. Uh, and so that's chemical reaction to electricity. So that's things like fuel cells, solar cells, electric vehicles, batteries, those sorts of things. Uh, in contrast, if you need energy to drive an electrochemical reaction, so that's taking electricity and putting it into a chemical system, that's the opposite of this, and we call that an electrolytic process. 
uh, electrolytic processes or all of these that I've highlighted here where energy is coming from an electrical source and being put into a chemical system in which case the change in free energy is positive we're going uphill we're going from a certain state chemical state to a higher chemical state in terms of energy and so it's important to affiliate these directionally with our formalisms of energy and free energy change. Okay, so I want to spend a few minutes then just just giving you some framing for um, maybe how you never thought of electrochemistry before, and, and I'm good at that because um, there's lots of ways that I've used electrochemistry that are pretty pretty weird and exotic. This is just one that we came up with in my lab, and so um, what we did was um, design a, a sensor that um, does both uh, electrolytic reactions and galvanic reactions for the sake of producing some signal that we can measure um, that is related to the concentration of metal ions in the solution. And our constraints, and, I'll, and I'll, I won't go into great depth, but our constraints were how do we produce something that's you know less than 50 cents, uh, that's shelf stable, that anybody can use, non-chemists, non-scientists, non-technically trained folks, um, and use tools that are available to us. And that's why we came up with this smartphone sensor um, th that is based on bipolar electrochemistry, which I'll show you. And so the first step in, uh, in doing this is to um, drive what's called an electroplating step. An electroplating step, it doesn't look like this, but I'm just showing you sort of so you understand electroplating, then I'll show you what it looks like on the actual sensor. So um, we have some voltage source, like a battery. This is just like a, who knows, like a double A battery, which puts out one and a half volts. Um, and you have the positive side of the battery and you have the negative side of the battery. The nomenclature in electrochemistry, if you remember, is that the negative pole of the electrode we call the cathode and the positive pole we call the anode and that may sound counterintuitive to you especially considering in chemistry we call anions positive even though uh, I mean anions is negative and cations as positive and so you can think about it um, as you know cathode attracts cations so a negative cathode attracts positive cations uh, but this is the nomenclature that electrochemists abide by so you've got this uh, energy source each pole on this is at different energies the positive pole is at a low energy the negative pole is at a higher energy and the energy difference there is delta E which you may have remembered from Nernst equation we'll talk about it again and so the positive electrodes at lower energy the negative electrodes at a higher energy if we have a bunch of lead 2 plus ions that are floating in solution that are, those are these green ions and we connect the battery and we allow current to flow remember current is electrons or moles of electrons flowing per second we measure that as amps, amperes, uh, or coulombs per second, I should say, is the, the other way to think about that. Um, if we allow this to flow, then and we apply a sufficient voltage, then what's going to happen at the negative pole, which is the, the right electrode here, if you look at this cartoon, is at the cathode, those positive ions are going to discharge. And discharge means they're going to accept two electrons via this reaction, where we have lead 2 plus which is aqueous plus two electrons goes to make lead zero and so that's what you're gonna get on that side of the electrode and on the positive side we're just gonna continue to drive the current so what we end up with is a bunch of lead that's been uh, plated on the surface this is lead zero which we would see on the spoon we'd actually see a dark black layer of lead on the surface of the, the spoon so we use this step in an analytical fashion um, because it, it serves as a concentration method. It takes this whole beaker, which has a dilute concentration of lead, right? So normally lead in drinking water uh, is in the very low part per billion range. Um, if it exceeds 15 part per billion, as you know uh, in this class from the Flint crisis, if it exceeds 15, that, that's uh, grounds for notification to the EPA uh, considering the, the lead and copper rule. So we're trying to measure things in like the single part per billion range. You've got a really dilute sample. That beaker is just water from your tap. Um, one method that analytical chemists um, that the employ is they concentrate stuff. 
stuff. And so electric chemistry is great for that because if I apply that negative voltage to that metal, I can take all of the ions that were once in the solution and bring them to the surface of my spoon. And now that I've got this green spoon, green being in this case the color of lead, that's a concentration uh, process. So now with our sensor, of course this is not what the sensor looks like, I'm just walking you through the two steps, we have our two, two steps. Now we go through an electrostripping or a stripping process where the first step was electrolytic where we put voltage in from a battery cell and the second step is a galvanic one where now we just uh, allow these wires to connect back to each other. The lead, because we brought it from low energy to high energy, is now in a high energy state and it wants to go back down to lead 2 plus. It's going to naturally dissolve off if we allow it to. Uh, and we allow it meaning connect the wires. What we're going to do is put something to measure the current in series here so we can monitor how many electrons flow through uh, as a function of these lead ions falling off. So as we connect them, what's going to happen, um, let's see if I can do that again, what's going to happen is those are going to desorb or, dis or uh, charge in this case. All those electrons are then going to flow up through the spoon into the meter and back down. We'll count all the electrons that go through and then we'll correlate that to how much lead was in the original. So we'll get some generic signal like this of current as a function of the energy, uh, which is unimportant in this case what that means. Uh, and that current then is proportional to how much lead, how many of these green little spheres were floating around in the original solution. So we could literally do this with a sp two spoons and a beaker and a multimeter and a battery. We could do this. Um, it's really cheap and easy to do. The problem is it still would require somebody to set all this stuff up, understand it, interpret the current, understand what that means, calibrate this thing, etc. Not to mention this is by no means a shelf-stable process. Multimeter is a hundred bucks. Um, it's easy for me to do. I could just go into my garage and set this up, but it may. But I'm an electrochemist. It's not something that we can deploy globally uh, and ask people to just keep it in their pocket for when they need to use it. So this is the original idea, but we need to uh, translate this to something that still satisfies the original external criteria to make this a viable, useful sensor. So where he came up this idea of converting electrochemistry to light, which is, you know, exactly what uh, an, an analytical chemist, I'm not really an analytical chemist, I'm a material scientist, but, but in the spirit of analytical chemistry, that's what, um, you know, this wonderful thing where we decided, well, you know, rubipi, uh, this molecule here is a ruthenium bipyridine complex. Um, if you tack on an electron to that, you reduce it, one electron reduction, which occurs at minus 1.25 volts, if you do that in the presence of this peroxisulfate species, which is a highly reactive S2O2 minus, by highly reactive, it's not really reactive. It just it's not shelf stable for super long in aqueous solution. You can keep it around for a few days. If you create this rubipi plus by tacking an electron, it's going to instantaneously and spontaneously react with this peroxisulfate to create this blue species here. Uh, which is a, a sulfate radical. That'll go on to react with uh, just a normal sulfate species. And then if you've taken 275, you'll know, you'll understand this. If you haven't, it doesn't matter, I can tell you. Uh, it goes through this thing called MLCT, which is metal ligand charge transfer. And this is this process where um, you've essentially added an energy to the ligand that's going to dump energy into um, the, the metal. And as it does so, um, that process as it sort of goes into this excited state um, of rubipi that's denoted by the asterisk or star that's excited state rubipi uh, 2 plus now uh, then that process or that species will drop back down and um, will that energy change that's left over because it has to go somewhere because of conservation of energy uh, it gets transduced uh, into a photon of light, uh, into this orange photon. And so uh, all this to say that if we can take that current that we were in this step measuring with a physical device, now what we can do is just transduce all of that current uh, and not measure it at all. 
uh, at least with a multimeter, because we're taking all of that current, which are these, uh, these negative electrons, and we're going to convert them into photons to light. How do we measure light? We do this all the time. Every time we open up our smartphone, smartphones are fantastic sensors. They have these wonderful CCDs, which you will have uh, used at this point by the time you watch this video. These sensors can measure light uh, to greater fidelity than any um, UV vis uh, or sp spectroscopy sensors could 20 years ago. The best, you know, world-class sensors that NASA was using to put on uh, satellites, uh, we now have in our pockets, you know, for the price of 100 bucks. So um, that that was the idea: is we use the same general idea of plating stripping, but now we transduce that that electronic current signal into light, and we measure that light with our cameras. So um, what we did to test this to see if it actually would work is we just took a beaker, literally like this, and we measured the current, but we tossed in this Rubippi solution into the into the bottom of the beaker, and we slowly changed the energy of the spoon, uh, and we recorded the current. And that's what this curve is that we're looking at, current as a function of energy at the spoon. And what we see is um, as we uh, continue to change the energy, I don't know if this works, let's see. Here we go. Uh, as we changed it, we drew a bunch of current and then all of a sudden, out at higher energy, we saw a light emit from the bottom of, it wasn't really a spoon, it was just a round electrode that we're using, but this is the light. And so what, what this tells us is the proof of idea, the proof of concept, this will work. We can transduce current into light, which then we can use a totally different mechanism to measure that signal. So if you sort of go all the way back, what we're doing is measuring part per billion levels of heavy metal ions in solution that we can't see through electrochemistry that gets transduced to an optical transduction method where we can see it with light. So of, of course we're not going to do this in a big beaker for reasons I mentioned before, and so we miniaturize this. And this is a picture of uh, not a picture, but a cartoon image of a of a of a wireless sensor. I'm in my house, so I don't have one uh, on me. But these sensors are about the size of the tip of your finger, or maybe two tips of your finger. They're fairly large at this point from a miniature sensor perspective. But that's simply because we're we're still working on them. We don't want to make them tiny. Uh, until we're done with them. But it looks like this. You've got this tiny little electrode um, and you put a water sample, which is just one tiny drop on one side. You put your Rubippi solution on the other side. They're totally separate. You connect this to a little coin cell battery, like a watch cell battery, and you connect it to your phone. And that H nu here is the light and both the intensity and the duration of light correlate to how many metal ions were in the original sample size. Right now, these sensors cost us about a quarter to manufacture, and we haven't scaled them. They're sim just simply using stuff that we've uh, found and, uh, and, and made work. So certainly, if you scaled this up, we could probably drive this down considerably. Okay, so last thing I'll mention here, uh, and I won't show you the actual um, data right now, but uh, I'm just trying to get you excited about uh, electrochemistry because it's it's pretty awesome uh, how how you can apply it to anything and make uh, anything work. Um, I wrote some even wackier wireless elect electrochemistry. So this miniaturized uh, version here, because we got rid of the beaker and we got rid of the electrodes. Actually, there's a tiny little sliver of an electrode that runs through the center of these, uh, but it's not connected to anything. It's floating. So you've got essentially a wire that's floating. Uh, and we can do electrochemistry on that wirelessly, which is mind-blowing. And that's this whole new idea called bipolar electrochemistry, which is a, a young field of electrochemistry. And we're certainly not going to go into the details of that. I'd love to, uh, if you're interested or if you want to do research, um, more, than, more than happy to walk you through that. But what I will show you, just because I think it's mind-blowing, is how this works. So um, this is just a, a sort of... Um, demonstration of how bipolar electrochemistry works and how this sensor is set up. So this is just a way boat uh, that you would have used before and then uh, I've got just two pieces of pencil lead here, uh, not pencil lead, it's actually graphite of course. Um, so you've got two pieces of graphite, those are conductive, so those are essentially electrodes that are just glued into either side of this boat and then on the inside this solution, the yellowish solution, 
is uh, water with some universal pH indicator added. Universal pH indicator uh, changes red when there's local high concentration of acid and blue when there's local high concentrations of base. And then I've got this little U shape, which is just a piece of gold. It's pure gold metal, not plated, real gold. Uh, so it's just this thin U. So what, what you notice is that this is this piece of gold, it's, it's just sitting there in solution. It's not connected to any energy source at all, right? It, it's what we would call in the physics world floating uh, because it's not grounded and it's not connected in series with any circuit. What's phenomenal about bipolar electrochemistry is these two pieces of graphite here, you can see the alligator clips connected, those go to a battery. So what I can do is apply a voltage with the battery and what that will do is induce a solution potential change or a voltage change in the solution which will drive a voltage change along the length of that gold even though it's not connected to anything. That's the principle we leveraged in designing this sensor. So it's completely wireless and detached from any power source. That's why we're able to decouple our two solutions, one with the water sample and one with the rubipi. So let's see if this GIF works, but if I play this what you'll see is a change in the color of the solution as you're generating protons at one side and hydroxide simply from splitting water. Uh, it's less important we know that chemistry, although that's you know fundamental water splitting chemistry. But it, what's more important is that you see the evolution of those color changes, not just at the electrodes that are connected to the power source, but also at the gold electrode that's not connected to anything. It's just floating and touching plastic on the bottom of the solution. So you can see this, it's just going to cycle, but you can see the evolution of a bluish hue on the left electrode, a reddish hue on the right, but then on the two halves of the gold electrode, if you, it may be faint for you to see because it's being recorded, uh, you have a red hue on the left and you have a blue hue on the right. Phenomenal, right? You're driving electrolytic reactions on a piece of metal that's not connected to anything. Uh, so this is the this is wireless electrochemistry.